Thanks for coming to learn about shelter cat enrichment. You'll be looking at some cutting edge, fresh, hot from the oven slides. <laughs> okay, so how many people are frontline animal care staff? So you interact with caretaking activities with the animals every day. Cool, and how many people are like support staff, administrative staff, you're like more of a manager level, or you work in an office? Okay, and how many people are like volunteers? Okay, did I miss anybody? Okay. Uh, cool, so one of the things about an enrichment program is that you need everybody's participation. So you can't go in as an administrator and say, we are going to do this without consulting your animal care staff and figuring out what works for them and what's gonna be feasible for them to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And if your animal care staff are coming to you and saying, we wanna do this, you're probably, you might have already been frustrated in the past by not having administrative support for the programs that you want to do. So we need to have everybody participate in these programs and we need to have everybody supporting the program. So it really does take the whole shelter. And I really want to focus on um, our enrichment programs and what we do. So Lollipop Farm is an open admission shelter. Um, we take in between 10 to 12,000 animals a year. We have all told a staff of about 90 but animal care staff, do you guys know how many animal care staff there are? There are two people from Lollipop here today. There, I think it's around, yeah, there's a lot of support staff. There's, I would say around 30 to 40 animal care staff, counselors, that kind of thing. Um, we also have a behavior department, but a lot of the things I'm gonna tell you are done by our frontline animal care staff. They're not done by the people in our behavior department. So. We're doing things like behavior modification, we're doing evaluations, we're doing one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations with owners, both pre and post adoption. So we have other things to do. A lot of the stuff is done by the people who take care of the animals every day. So I just wanna give you some ideas and things to try and things, just tell you some things that have worked for us. All right, so, oh, how many people were at Kelly Bowen's talks this morning? Okay, so some of this will be review for you. So I should have like made it into a quiz so you guys can answer the questions. But uh, Companion animals in a shelter are not their natural environment. So what's the natural environment of a companion animal? A home. And we really need to create a complex and stimulating environment so that they can both perform species typical behaviors, behaviors that they would perform in a home or when they're behaviorally healthy. Um, and we just need to take that extra step to stimulate them because they're in such a stressful environment. And in my mind, enrichment's not optional. You have to have some enrichment program. I think it's, we owe it to the animals and we owe it to ourselves because as you'll find those of you who have enrichment programs, it's fun to do. Like everybody loves doing this. Once you can figure out how to fit it into your day, it's a really fun thing to do. Uh, but you have to find strategies that work for the animal care staff. So it can't just be a top-down approach where you come in and you say, we are going to do this and you are going to do this. You really have to get people to buy into the programs. And like I said before, the same token, you as an animal care staff person, try to educate the people who are making your budget, the people who are allocating resources and time to tell them, like, this is why we need to do this for the animals. This is why we need that extra hour in the day so that we can do this. All right, so one of the guiding principles I think about when I'm thinking about enrichment is I want to consider the natural history of the species or the typical environment of the species. And today I'm talking about cats and dogs, but at Lollipop Farm, we are an open admission shelter. And if you bring us an animal, we will try to figure out how to care for it and how to enrich it. And if it's wildlife, we'll figure out where it needs to go. But uh, so we have iguanas, we have turtles, we have farm animals. Um, so whenever we're creating a new enrichment plan, these are sort of the things I use to help guide that plan. So they, this is my house. These are my cats and my husband. So uh, the typical you know, environment of the cat is a home. And think about how many options they have in a home. So they can be like on your desk, messing up your paperwork like a little jerk, or you know, hiding in the bathtub to like creep on you when you're in the bathroom. Um, they could be snuggling with a human friend or with a cat friend or with a dog friend. They've got lots of options about how they spend their time and where they spend their time and what they do with their day. In addition, they have 
lots of different smells that they're reacting to. There are cooking smells, there are food preparation smells, lots of delicious and interesting smells. And there's birds out the window, there's wildlife to look at in a lot of homes, um, or there's toy stimulation. So cats in homes have lots of choices and they get lots of stimulation just naturally during the day, much more than you would get in a typical shelter environment. Another guiding principle, and this sort of echoes what Kelly was saying earlier, and you can all, whenever I give this, I've showed this slide a couple of times before in a couple different talks, and no one ever, like no animal audience has ever been like, oh, a baby, come on, this is such a cute baby. It's my niece and my parents' cat, and they're getting along quite nicely, and they're both choosing to be around each other, but it's okay that you didn't say she was the most adorable baby ever. I know she is, so. Uh, anyway, uh, choices and control are really important. And choice has actually been found to be a primary reinforcer. So primary reinforcers are things that you don't have to teach animals or people to work for. So primary reinforcers are typically thought of food, water, things that are basic needs. Uh, but they've actually done experiments that have shown that having the ability to make a choice can be reinforcing. So that just having a choice alone or having control over a situation can change behavior. So there was a series of experiments in the 60s and 70s that looked at uh, babies and control. So they had two sets of babies and they all had mobiles above their cribs. And one set of babies, when they moved their heads, the mobiles would turn. And when they were still, they would stop turning. And the other set of babies got just as much motion, but it was untethered to the baby's movement. So the babies had no control over when the mobiles were going and when they weren't. And the babies who had control over the motion of the mobile moved more, they laughed more, they smiled more, they were obviously enjoying themselves more. So their behavior changed just by the fact that they could control when the mobile was moving or how much it was moving. And there was another experiment in the 60s done on nocturnal deer mice and lights. And the original intention of this uh, research was to try to figure out this nocturnal deer mice has uh, some preference for the amount of light in their environment. So they are usually coming out at a certain time of night when there's a certain amount of light. So they trained some mice in a lab to basically control a dimmer switch. So they taught them how to change the level of light in the room, and they had two switches, one on either side of the room. So they were like, this is going to be great. We're going to confirm that the mice like this amount of light. And what actually happened was that once the mice learned to control the light, they spent all their time running back and forth to flip the lights on and off. <laughs> and so it changed their behavior, and they actually overcame an aversion to bright light just by being able to control the light. So when you can provide choice and control to animals, um, number one, you will see happier behavior, more joyful behavior from them, but you will also see that they're less stressed and that they can overcome things that were maybe even aversive to them. All right, so when I am getting started uh, with a new species or with a new program, uh, I wanna first meet with the staff involved, so the people who are taking care of the animals. I wanna meet with them um, after I've done my research on the natural history of the species and thinking about where can we can increase choice and control. And then what I do is give them a bunch of options and let them choose some. Because again, we want to create choice, right? So we want to create choice for staff too. And so this is just an example. It's hard to see on the screen and you'll get these PowerPoints later. Because um, again, I finished it last night. So uh, this is an example we're starting or we're sort of revamping our enrichment procedures for the farm. So I went through and looked at all the species that we house on the farm, and then I did research to see what are other facilities doing for uh, enrichment and where are other places that we could encourage them to do species typical behavior or just to have more choice and control. So then I come to the farm staff with this list of options. So it's a bunch of different things that cows might like. Uh, and then I want the farm staff to choose three, and they're gonna try each one at least three times. So I want to see, is there gonna be a consistent use of this item, or is the cow gonna consistently interact with a football that we put in the pasture? Um, and then I want them to make observations. So we wanna be really sort of critical about the changes we're making, 
and make sure that the animals overall are enjoying them. And you want to do this on an individual basis too. So if you make an intervention for an animal and it doesn't seem to make a difference for that animal, okay, let's think of a different intervention we can do for that animal. But you want to be a pretty clear-headed observer so that you're not wasting time and resources doing something that sort of feels good but is not actually making a difference. Um, and then we really evaluate whether to continue each activity or not, and maybe we swap out a different activity and try that activity with the animals until we get a pretty good plan that's working for the animals we have at the time. And those are actually my parents' cows. I grew up on a farm, so they're no annoy. And they have a, some enrichment. They have some brushes to rub up, up against and things like that. OK. The way that we do record keeping for our cat enrichment is um, a couple different ways. So the first is we have this board. It's a whiteboard in our adoption area. And again, sorry, it's a little hard to read. It's the cats that need extra socialization. So these are the cats that we've identified that need a little bit extra time. They might need any of the interventions that we're going to talk about in just a minute. They might need out of kennel time. They might need more quiet socialization time. Sometimes that's noted here. Sometimes it's noted on their record on their cage. Um, but it's just an easy way to keep track. So when you're at the very least when you're first starting out, you don't want to get swamped down in like oodles of paperwork and we're just keeping track of every single thing that we're doing. I would say just try to keep track this way and you know this works for us. We also borrowed this idea from the ASPCA a few months ago and it's working really well. So people take the binder clips and when they socialize a cat that's on the list, they get a binder clip put on their clipboard. And then at the end of the day or in the morning the next day, all the clips get taken down again so we can ensure that everyone has had attention that needs attention that day um, and that no one's just getting overlooked day after day. For our cats in our holding areas, so we have, um, we have many more volunteers who are in our adoption area. In our holding area, we have fewer volunteers, so it's mostly staff interacting with the cats. And in those areas, we have these behavior alert sheets so it's almost like a medical alert sheet. Staff notices there's an issue. Um, different from the medical alerts in that they have some things that they might try first. So giving a hiding place, giving feel away. Again, we'll talk all about this in a second. Um, and then if their interventions don't seem to be improving the behavior, uh, they very quickly call in a behavior department consult. So I come in evaluate the cat for them and give them a more detailed training plan or enrichment plan for the cat. So these sheets follow the cats to the cat room and often those are the cats that are on the board in need of special attention. Um, there are a few things that, a lot of these things that we're gonna talk about that all the cats get. So we don't even keep track of a lot of that because I would rather five more cats get quiet time with humans than that human spend the time doing like five sheets of paperwork. All right, so for those of you who are at uh, Kelly's talk, some of this will be a little bit of review. I want to start out first with environmental enrichment. So this is all about options. We want to give cats options for where to spend their time. So even in the tiniest cage, if we can give them a couple different options, that is ideal. And whether it is just going to the liquor store and getting some boxes to throw in the cages, um, we have a couple different commercially made hiding boxes. There are some really great cages that have built-in hiding places that you can't take away. Those are my favorite because then you can't take away the hiding place. They always have a hiding place. And even if they don't need it, they have the option to go there. Logistically, in our shelter, uh, we don't give them all hiding places right off the bat. Do I wish that we would? Sure, but we don't. We don't. The staff doesn't have the time. It just doesn't happen. So we fast track cats. So if they seem really shy, they instantly get a hiding place. And it might be a hiding box. It might be a towel covering a cage. So it might look like one of these things. Um, and you can say, oh my god, you guys are like the quietest. Like, I'm going to start calling on you, asking questions and stuff. Uh, so even if you don't have a fancy hiding box or you didn't make it to the liquor store for the empty boxes, you know. Uh, then you can still use a towel or a sheet to cover part or all of the cage. And you can gradually reduce the amount of the cage covered as the cat starts to come out of their shell. 
So again, we're just giving them some options. So we always, of course, want to make sure that everyone has a comfy place to sleep. And you can really pay attention to the cats and start to see what their preference is. So some of them will really like this big round bed that they can really tuck themselves into. Some of them are going to prefer a more open setting. And they like snuggling with their little stuffed animal friend. But it's best to just give them choices. Again, that's one of the things you just want to keep in your mind is let's give them options. Let's observe what options they seem to prefer and then encourage more of those options if we can. So we are lucky enough to have a lot of offices. So we often do office fosters. This was my office one kitten season. I had left for like five minutes. And I came back, and they had trashed the place. So uh, you have to be somewhat careful who you're putting in an office. Um, you want to make sure if it's a really, really shy, fearful cat that it's not going in an office that's going to have 50 people walking through it every single day. You want to put that cat in a quiet office. If you have a cat who's overstimulated and who's reaching out and grabbing everyone who walks by their cage, that might be a good cat for the 50 a day office. Um, and you know, this is a luxury that we have. There's, I know a lot of shelters don't have the option to do office fosters. Um, we haven't done it, but I have seen other shelters harness train cats. Um, I guess we have done a couple, but it's, we don't do it regularly, but that's another option. If you have a cat who needs a lot more stimulation and more out of kennel time, but we don't have a big room to do it in, then you could potentially harness train them. So again, we are lucky to have a bunch of different options for housing. So we can, again, see what the cat's preference is and then try to tailor their stay to that preference. So we have a couple big colony rooms that we house typically eight usually eight to 10 cats in. And then we have several smaller colony rooms that are going to house two to four cats. And then we have some bigger cages also that we can house pairs of cats or groups of kittens. Um, and typically, we're putting kittens in the smaller colonies as well. So if you are going, if they come in together, that's one thing. Usually, cats who come in together, as you guys all know, they tend to get along in the shelter. Sometimes not. Sometimes you have to definitely monitor that because you can see some cats are causing each other more stress and would do better separated. Um, but if you're going to make a pair, you're going to make a colony, or you're going to make a group to live together, you definitely want to match energy levels. So you don't want to put shy, calm, 10-year-old cat with seven-month-old kitten who's just going to beat the crap out of you know, 10-year-old cat. Uh, you want to make sure that you are making a group that is going to be OK with people walking right in their room. So in our shelter, people can walk in these big rooms um, unattended. They can just go right in. And we try to keep it to a limit of six people in the room. But you know, then somebody's on a tour, and there's a school group, and it can get a little crazy. So you want to, we have to make sure that we have pretty solid cats in that room. Uh, and that is something that you want to consider, too. Even if this cat has been here for nine months, and they, you know, that, that might not be a valid reason to put them in the colony, just the fact that they've been there a long time. You want to make sure that it's going to be beneficial to them to live in that kind of setting. All right, any questions about housing or environmental enrichment? OK. So at our shelter, we play classical music in all of the animal areas. So we have a classical NPR station in Rochester, 91.5. And we play 91.5 in most of the areas. If the radio doesn't come in very well, we play classical CDs. Um, I like NPR a lot because it's classical music, and then it's calm human voices. So it's a nice way to keep them used to hearing human voices as well. Uh, we do sometimes do bird and nature sounds for 10, 15 minutes at a time. And that's really fun because it gets everyone to like perk up and get interested and say, like, ooh, what's that? Uh, and that might be something, again, that they're going to hear in a typical home. But you don't want those on all the time, and they're just going to habituate to them. So that's for a shorter amount of time. And then you can go back to the classical music. And you definitely turn everything off at night so that they have silence. And just like Kelly talked about, they want, you want them to have darkness as well. So. If you're planning a new shelter, make sure that you're not putting the cat area in a place where you have to walk through the dog areas to get to the other cat area. That happened at our shelter. <laughs> it's not 
fun. So if to go from the cat holding area, you have to walk through a hallway that borders a dog area. And going from a really quiet, calm, peaceful cat area to all of a sudden you're in the hallway and you can hear barking dogs, it freaks out some cats. They're, they're not happy about it. So if at all possible, try to place your cat area in a place where they can't hear barking dogs. Uh, that's definitely going to help de-stress them a little bit. And Kelly mentioned this too. There is actually classical music designed for cats now that was getting attention a few months ago. Has anyone heard it? It's super weird, right? Like, I was like, mm, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be able to listen to this. It's not made for people. That's absolutely right. And there are like purring sounds in it and weird sounds. And it's not cats or birds. It's like one guy and, yeah, it's one guy like modulating his voice to make all these weird noises. But cats have really interesting reactions to it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the NPR story has some samples of it as well. So you could Google. NPR music for cats and get a little sample of it to play for your cats at home. And that brings up one point that you'll see. Um, so I have the two cats, black fluffy cat, who you'll see later doing clicker training, and the flame point Siamese cat. And if I'm going to try something on the shelter cats, I often try it on my own cats first. Like they're my little test dummies. They're both foster failures. Uh, so. If I'm going to try a new toy or a new activity, then I often see how they react to it before I bring it into the shelter. All right, uh, pheromone therapy, we do utilize feel away. Um, we typically spray it on a little stuffed animal, and then that animal is going to work its way through the shelter with the cat. So they have their little buddy that goes with them, and it at first has feel away on it, and at other times it just has their scent. Does anybody not know what feel away is? OK, awesome. I can skip talking about it. I've definitely seen variable effects with it. Some cats don't seem to notice it at all. I've seen a few cats be actively repelled by it, but that's pretty uncommon. So most cats are at least interested in it and sniff it. And some are really excited by it and want to rub on the cat or on the little stuffy. So catnip. How many of you guys use catnip in your shelter? Oh, interesting. Like only half. So. Catnip can be great, but again, you want to observe the individual animal and note their response. So if you have an overstimulated cat and you're like, let's try catnip and see if it just you know, zonks them out and it does the opposite, no more catnip for that cat. If you have a depressed cat who's not eating very well and you give them catnip and they perk up and they eat and all right, catnip for that cat. But you really want to evaluate each cat and see what their reaction is before you use it on a regular basis. And it's only for singly housed cats. So we have a lovely volunteer who, bring, who brings in fresh catnip. And one day last summer, I walked into one of the big colony rooms. And I was like, what is going on? Is this a new group that like, hates each other? Like Everyone was twitching, and tails were thrashing around. And it was like, everyone, it just, everyone was a little bit on edge. And I was like, starting to look around. And I was like, oh my gosh, this room is like filled with catnip. So we had to shut down the room for the afternoon to give the cats time to come down off their high uh, before we could let a doctor see them again. And you don't want to trigger a reaction where half the cats go up, half the cats go down on the catnip, and you have issues. So only for singly housed cats. Uh, and has anybody tried silver vine in their shelter? So this is one of those things that like I tried it at home first, and it's sort of like super catnip to my cats. Like it was too much for my cats. I could I had to I only did it a couple times before I was like, okay, <laughs> way too much. Because typically my cats will eat the catnip, play a little bit, and then zonk out. And the silver vine made them go like up, up, up for a long time. So we've used it a little bit in the shelter, but again, follow the same rules as catnip and definitely evaluate each animal's individual uh, reaction. And we can I think you can get it in a lot of the pet supply stores. Um, it usually comes in like a little tube. It looks like a crystal light or something, like it's a little powder. Yeah. All right. Uh, feeding enrichment is a place that uh, in our enrichment program right now, we're not doing a whole lot of this, but it's one of those areas that I definitely want to expand into. Uh, one of the things that we do use for feeding time is a little bit of counter conditioning. So when 
you are trying to counter condition an animal to some, something negative. You can follow it by something positive. And they can start to learn that the negative thing is always followed by a positive thing. And so that makes the negative thing not quite as bad over time. So what used to happen was they would go in to feed the cats and to kind of lure them away to the area that they were cleaning them. They would use the wet food to kind of lure them to a different area. And what we do now is we do the cleaning and then they get their wet food. So we do it in a different order so that you can sort of start to build a little bit of a counter conditioning response to that cleaning. Uh, and that seems to be working pretty well. But there are all kinds of fun feeding enrichments you can do with cats, all the way from you know, commercially made puzzle toys that you know, I paid over $20 for that and my cats eat out of it every day, um, to making things like that with paper towel tubes or Dixie cups. You can get really creative. I mean, you can just do a Tupperware with holes cut in it, let them reach in to grab stuff out. You can do Easter egg Kongs, so half of an Easter egg with a little bit of wet food at the bottom. It's just monitor the cat to make sure they're not chomping the egg in half and eating the plastic shards. But most cats don't do that, and they want to just try to figure out how to get the food from the end of the Easter egg. So there's a lot of stuff. For this, right now, we're doing this in a more targeted way. So if we have an overstimulated cat, then they might get feeding enrichment maybe out of a, a, to a ball toy like that. Um, but this is definitely something that I'm trying to expand a little bit. Just a check-in. Do you guys have any questions at all yet? OK. All right, so another type of feeding enrichment that we do is we provide running water in all the colony rooms. So we have fountains in all the colony rooms. All of our fountains have been donated. So even if you get a fountain that's used, we tend to try to clean it as best we can and then use it in the cat room. And they seem to really like it. All right, so one of the things that's super fun to do with cats is to train them using clicker training or positive reinforcement. And this gives them a little bit of control over the outcome of their behavior. So they get to start to learn that they can do behaviors that equal powerful positive reinforcement. And you can use this in a variety of ways. So you can actually use positive reinforcement to teach them to do better with uh, ha husbandry or handling or medical behaviors. So if you're doing a nail trimming, just keep a little bit of tuna right next to you. And every time you clip a nail, give them some tuna, and the next time you go to cut that cat's nails, they're going to be a lot nicer about it than if you had not done the tuna. Even if you have a really calm cat, uh, you can still work in some positive reinforcement for allowing you to do some of these behaviors. If you haven't already checked it out, I would definitely encourage you to look up Sophia Yin's Low Stress Handling and Behavior Modification book. There's a lot of really great stuff in there on um, using positive reinforcement to counter condition medical procedures. And it's a great book anyway for low stress handling. So I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. You can also use positive reinforcement training just for mental enrichment, so just for fun. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos of that. And you can train a cat to do anything that you can train a dog to do. So Grumpkin is my black cat. That's the older cat. She is trained to do all the things that we teach the dogs to do in basic manners class. Um, and she has a bunch of tricks as well. So She's actually faster at learning new behaviors than my English setter. <laughs> the English setter is a hard worker, but she's not as quick as the cat. So we can definitely use this just for mental enrichment. And we can also use it through the mental enrichment training. You can really build confidence in shy cats as well. So um, I know Katie, I'm going to point her out, did some training with one of our really shy cats recently and got her to start coming to the front of the cage instead of hiding in the back always, and even to start to accept some petting. So again, it's scary thing followed by good thing. Repeated exposure to that helps them feel better about the scary thing. Um, and then the mental enrichment training, we use clicker training. So one pro tip for cat training is to use really tasty meat. So I work with uh, private training clients through Lollipop Farm also, so I do in home consultations for cat behavior. And sometimes I get a really fun lesson where someone's just like, oh, come teach me how to clicker train my cat. And maybe they've tried before and they've just used the Friskies treats. Like, that's not going to cut it. Like, get the canned chicken, get the, you know, tuna, cream cheese, 
Grumpkin loves smoked turkey, fresh bites. You got to get something really, really tasty. And you want it to be little tiny pieces that they're going to just eat, and then it goes away. So you're just giving them a taste of it, and it goes away. So you're not giving them like a giant chunk of liverwurst every time they do a behavior that you like. Just a little taste, and then it's gone. So in clicker training, how many people have clicker trained a cat? OK. How many people are going to clicker train a cat after the talk? Yeah, come on, there'll be more hands after this. All right. So. It's very easy. There's nothing magical about the clicker. Um, and the concept is science. So when they do the behavior that you like, they hear that sound, and that's followed by a food reward or food reinforcement. And they're going to start to figure out that every time I do the behavior that I was doing when I heard this, I get another click and a treat. So I'm going to start to repeat the behavior I was doing when I heard this. So it's more effective than trying to just get the food to their mouth the instant that they do the behavior that you like because you're really communicating to them that that behavior right there, that's what you're getting the reinforcement for, whatever you were doing when you heard the click. So it really helps with timing, and it really is a way to communicate with your animal. So when you interact with a clicker-savvy animal with a clicker, as you'll see with Grumpkin in a video in just a second, it's really cool because you can really tell them that you can give them a lot of feedback about their behavior, and you can train them to do things very quickly. And it's also very mentally stimulating. So in dogs, there's this history. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to sort of make a comment that I found that at the workplace, one of the ingredients we offer some was a meat clicker. And just because the ones for dogs are so loud to a cat that it kind of. Yeah, yeah, I was going to talk about that. Yeah, with cats, I often even use like Snapple bottle lids. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can definitely muffle it in your, yeah, you want to muffle it in your pocket when you're first starting or use a Snapple bottle lid that's such, like, like I said, there's nothing magical about the clicker. So it can even be a sound that you make with your mouth. It just, the marker signal, this is what this is called, needs to be the same every time. So for a deaf animal, we might use a light. It doesn't even have to be a sound. It's just a signal to the animal that whatever you were doing, that's why you're getting the reinforcement. Yeah, if I'm working with a single cat in a colony room, then I'm paying everyone else, which means I'm feeding everyone else for staying away. I usually call feeding paying. So it's <laughs> sort of like how I think about it. I, I, so if I am working with this cat right here, there's probably going to be other cats creeping around, and then I'm going to toss them tuna for staying back there. But I'm not going to be clicking them necessarily. I'm going to be focusing on this one cat and clicking with her while I sort of lure the other ones away by tossing treats to them as they stay away. All right, so in dog training, there's this long history of punishment and intimidation-based training where you force the dog into the position you want, and then you punish them if they try to get out of the position. And happily, there's not a whole lot of that in cat training. And people think it's kind of even like suggesting that you would train a cat like that is really silly. And if they don't do the behavior you're looking for in clicker training, nothing happens. So with a clicker savvy animal, they're going to be like, oh, I didn't get a click. Like, oh, I better try something different. And you're going to see a different behavior. So it can really build creativity in your animal. And that's part of the reason why it's so mentally stimulating. So some basic clicker training rules. Um, you really want to click and reinforce the behaviors you want to happen more often. If you click, you have to feed. So the click itself never becomes its own reward. You are always clicking to tell them that's the behavior you're getting the reinforcement for. Once they know a behavior pretty well, and they're like running up to you and sitting, or they're running up to you and offering a high five, then you don't have to click each time. So the clicker is really for teaching new things. Then once they are doing the behaviors on their own, uh, you can go to reinforcing them every once in a while. So you start to be more random with your reinforcement. And it is very mentally stimulating. There's another one of my office fosters trying to mess up my phone. All right. So 
basic training, this goes for any animals, number one, you want to get the behavior. So you want to get them to do the behavior, and then you want to reinforce the behavior. And that's going to make the behavior more, happen more often. Three ways to get the behavior. Capture, so wait for the animal to do the behavior on their own, and then mark and reinforce. You can shape, so that is thinking of a more complex behavior, and marking and reinforcing little steps till you get the end behavior that you want. And I'm going to show you both of these uh, with Grumpkin in a second. And luring is another way to get a behavior. So that is putting food on their nose and moving them around into the position you want them to be in. And for cats and clicker training, I don't really use luring because a lot of cats aren't that good at it. Dogs are really good at it. Like you put a piece of hot dog in a dog's nose and they're going to like follow the hot dog until they get to eat the hot dog. A lot of cats, like you put a little tuna on their nose and they're sort of like, there goes the tuna. So I tend to use capturing and shaping more with cats, and it's more mentally stimulating anyway. Luring, I think of as kind of a lazy way to train. Uh, and so if I have my options, I'm definitely going to use capturing and shaping. And here's Grumpkin sitting. Everyone's sitting for their treat, the dogs and the cat. And with cats, I always start with targeting. Targeting is teaching the cat to touch a part of their body to a target. And with cats, I usually start with a chopstick and teaching them to touch their nose to the end of the chopstick. Uh, for dogs, the first behavior we often teach is sitting, and it's a stationary behavior. For cats, the first behavior I want to teach is a moving behavior because cats sit a lot. Cats sit more than dogs. If you, if you really start to look at your cats and your dogs, your cats are sitting more. And if, you first, if that's the first behavior you reinforce them for doing is sitting, it can be hard to get some cats to like get up and start doing other behaviors. Like They want to stick with that first behavior that worked. So I like to start with targeting because it teaches them to move. It teaches them to follow the target. And it's something that's really easy to capture. Because for a lot of cats, you present a new object in their environment. And they're going to naturally go to smell it and investigate it. So you can very easily mark and reinforce. All right, so this is a little kitten. <laughs> and so see. I wait for him to touch his nose. So I'm putting the tuna in the tray for him to eat, because that seems to help him localize the tuna. And most of these videos were taken yesterday. So. <laughs> so you could see he was a little bit apprehensive at first. He was a little bit um, like, do I touch it with my paw? Do I, okay. do I approach it? Um, but by the end, was more confidently approaching it with, her, with his nose. And he was a little bit overstimulated. He was in with a really shy mom. And so he definitely needed a little bit of stimulation. Um, the next cat is uh, an adult cat who seemed pretty perky. When you're going around to your shelter and you're starting to do clicker training with your cats, the easiest way to start is just see who looks perky and then see if they'll eat what you have. Because if they're perky and they eat, practice with those cats first. So you want to, they need to eat for the clicker training and a perkier cat's going to give you more behavior to work with. All right, so here's this little, little black cat. So if you see, he was having trouble locating the tuna also, so I started giving it to him right off my hand. That seemed to help him. And this was his first session. We've never done this with him before.
All right, so that cat's just had a little mental workout. His day has just been brightened a little bit. Um, he's a little bit less likely to be frustrated later on in the day, uh, and he's a little bit more likely to sleep soundly at night because he's just been challenged a little bit mentally. All right, this is a video of me training my cat from a few years ago, um, and she's going to demonstrate a lot of the basic principles that we just talked about. So first I'm going to start with a little bit of target training with her as well, and then we're going to go to, um, I'll show you a couple of her tricks, and then we're going to go to capturing. So I want to teach her a new behavior. So instead of a nose target, I look for a paw target, or as a normal human would call it, a high five. Uh, and so I want her to do a new behavior, and you'll see she tries a couple things and they don't work, and so then she is, gets creative. Um, and then I'm going to show you some shaping with her. So I want to shape her to go lie down on a mat. So if you remember, that is marking and reinforcing the little steps along the way towards a more complex behavior. So I will try to talk you through it and lean forward so you can hear the clicks too. All right, here we go. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you gave the dog some for nothing. And I know I need to brush my cat. Yeah. Puts her down. You see the dog did it too. So rolling over is one of her tricks, which she was like, I'll do that for you. So you can do a nose target with your finger, too. It doesn't have to be a chopstick or an object. Sorry. So here's where we want to teach her a high five. So she tries nose targeting, doesn't work. So she's a clicker trained animal, she tries something new. <laughs> so this is shaping to go lie down on a mat. So first, I'll reinforce just walking towards the mat. And she didn't see the food there. We'll give it to her. And I'm tossing it away because I want the whole behavior to be go to the mat and lie down. So now we have go to the mat and sit. So I want to raise the criteria a little bit, see if we can get something that looks more like a down. <laughs> so she tries a wave here. And she's like, oh, that didn't work. So she put her head down a little bit. So that's when I clicked. And now in her head, she's like, OK, so just sitting didn't work. Wave didn't work. But I put my head down, and I got a click. Aww. You can definitely do some amazing things with your cat. I mean, that was not not even that amazing for cat training. So you only want to add the verbal cue when it looks perfect. So when you're doing shaping, you want to shape it so that the behavior looks awesome, looks perfect. Then you add the verbal cue or the hand signal or whatever your cue is going to be. So for her, I didn't add it until that mat was like a magnet to her. Like I, and it's a, it's a napkin. She's a small cat. <laughs> so you know the napkin goes out on the ground, and now she's like pew towards it. And so when I was adding the verbal cue, as soon as I would put it down, I would say, uh, relax, that's the cue in my house to go lie on your mat. And she would run right over to the mat and lie down. And then you can start to get into, you know, 
cue discrimination where if it's out but I don't ask you to do it, maybe I'm not going to reinforce you for that. But most of the behaviors I teach my animals are ones that I want them to just do naturally on their own. So I don't mind if they do it if I didn't cue them to do it. Does that make sense? OK. Because some dog trainers get really into like, oh, they can only do it. It's called stimulus control. They can only do it if I tell them to do it. And then they shouldn't do it if I don't cue them to do it. But to me, that's not, I, I'm not going to teach my animals to do something that's really annoying or that I don't want them to do. All right, moving on again. Um, visual enrichment with cats. Um, with cats, since they are, more, they don't go for walks like dogs do typically in a, sh in a shelter, so we want to give them stuff to look out outside their cage. Um, we have all, most of our cages have visual access to the outside, and so we put up bird feeders, um, and we try to give them things to look at. But you can do things like perpetual motion machines or bubbles in front of the cage. Bubbles are the best. Like, I love blowing bubbles for cats. If you just need a stress reliever, go blow some bubbles for some cats. We do put up little party decorations and things in the holding areas. Um, and it's better if it's moving or changing because they just are going to habituate to things like this, but it's better than nothing. So we do put them up, and sometimes we'll have a fan on to have them move around a little bit. All right. Uh, play uh, can, it's really important for all of the animals to have toys in their cage or their kennel. They don't have to be commercially made toys, but they've done studies that have shown that they're actually more attractive to adopters if they have toys in their cage. And even if you don't think that they're playing with the toys, maybe they play with them at night when you're not there. So it's good, again, to give them the option or the choice to play with those if they want to. We use a lot of non-commercially uh, made toys, like cotton balls, dried pasta, plastic Easter eggs. I look like a crazy person at Easter. It looks like I have like 50 children. <laughs> Get Easter eggs every time I go to the store. Um, and we use a lot of Mardi Gras beads or pipe cleaners, like tied to the front of the kennel. Um, and sometimes we'll thread things through the pipe cleaners, like a jingle ball or a little paper fan or something like that. And don't underestimate your recyclables. Um, at home and at the shelter, basically no paper product goes used only once. <laughs> Everything gets recycled before it gets actually recycled, reused before recycled. All right, exercise for cats is really important, especially for your singly housed cats. It's important for them to get out and touch the ground so that they can run around and stretch and play. Um, again, if they're really shy and shut down, you don't want to force them out of their cage. But if they are an active cat, then we definitely need to do this with them. And we will do, we have four on the floor program. So on each cage in the adoption area, we have a four on the floor card that tells us how often they've gotten down on the floor in the last week. And it's not, it's only for healthy cats if they're on med if they're on medication or they are potentially sick, then they don't get to do four on the floor at that time. And these are all cats who have gone through our vetting process, so they're on the adoption floor. We do also do a lot of out-of-cage playtime for our frustrated or overstimulated cats. And we'll use wand toys for that. And when you're playing with a cat with a wand toy, you want to think, I want this wand toy to mimic a bird. And birds spend most of their time on the ground, and they occasionally fly up. So don't just wing the toy around like this. Uh, have it, you know, graze along the ground, hide behind things. You can really get a cat engaged if you are thinking like a bird and allowing them to hunt the bird. Scratching is really important for cats. Uh, we use a lot of stretch and scratch. So this is this little device here. Um, it is a little cardboard scratcher that you can attach to the front of their cage. I really like them. They travel through the shelter with the cat, and then they either go home with the cat or they get recycled uh, after their stay, so we don't reuse them for disease control reasons. But they're really great, and they give them just an additional point of stimulation and exercise if they are housed in a cage. And in our colony rooms, we have lots of scratching posts and things like that. One really important thing to do in a shelter is give them quiet time with people because, again, this is something that I just want to echo that Kelly said. In a home, most of their time with their family is going to just be the cat is just chilling out somewhere. <laughs> They're not getting a ton of extra stimulation and interaction with the people. So quiet time with humans is really important, but even with quiet time, you want to give them choices. 
And my big soapbox thing that I have been working on with the staff and the volunteers is asking permission for petting. So it's really easy to ask a cat for permission to pet the cat, and cats are not shy about telling you whether they want to be petted or not. And I do a basic cat behavior talk for all of our incoming staff and volunteers, and I've done it out in the community, and I always ask people, what does your cat do when they don't want you to pet it anymore? And they say, oh, they move away, they swap me, they bite me. I'm like, oh my god, what are you doing to your cats? Because all that you need to know if you're asking permission for petting, you are presenting your hand near the cat's face, a few inches away. If you get a cheek rub or a headbutt, the cat is saying, pet me, please. If you don't, if they just sniff you or look at you, the cat is saying, no, thank you. I'm fine. They don't need to move away. They don't need to swat you. A lot of cats won't move away, and then you're petting them, and they escalate to aggression. So this is what saying yes to petting looks like. So I pet her a little bit, and then I ask permission again. She gives me permission, so I pet her a little bit more. But I encourage people to just keep checking in with the cat that you're interacting with. Keep giving them the choice to interact with you or not. And this is the denial of petting. <laughs> so you can see, she didn't hiss. She didn't look horribly stressed. She wasn't like cowering. Her eyes weren't blown or anything. She was just like, I'm fine no, thank you. And I was like, okay, no problem. I'll check in with you later. And that's really, you know, all that you need to do, all that you need to think about when you're giving quiet time or petting a cat. So for more cat clicker training info, clickertraining.com is a great website. And the Denver Dumb Friends League website has some really good handouts on basic cat clicker training. And as a quick thank you, the staff and volunteers at Lollipop Farm who helped me with a bunch of videos and pictures in the last week. Thanks for coming.